What if I told you you don't need to have money to create wealth in real estate? Experienced real estate investors create wealth by using OPM, other people's money. What about that expression that you need to have money to make money? Well, that's true, but it doesn't have to be your own money. Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. My mission is to help a thousand people create a million dollars in net worth with real estate investing. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. Today, I wanna walk you through how you can legally raise capital for your next real estate deal. If you've never raised capital for a real estate deal, you could be missing out on incredible opportunities. There's an expression in real estate that you either have run out of your own money or that you will run out of your own money. So if you wanna scale your real estate investing business, you may wanna look at raising capital or using OPM. But in Canada, it isn't as simple as just taking an investor's money. There are regulations that you need to abide by to raise capital legally. If you violate those rules, regulators can impose sanctions on your business, fine you, and in extreme cases, you could be looking at jail time. Needless to say, it's important you understand how to raise capital so you don't end up tarnishing your reputation, losing money, or ending up in the slammer. So in this video, I'll walk you through the securities laws relevant to raising capital, the registration requirements, and the seven ways you can legally raise capital here in Canada. Before we dive in too far, I wanna just say that I am not a lawyer, so if you're unsure at all of what you can and can't do when it comes to securities, engage a securities lawyer in your local province or state. I'll leave a link in the description below to the securities lawyers I use in my business here in Ontario. So what are securities? Securities are the investment vehicle that the money you are raising is being used for. Think of it this way, a security is like an actual vehicle getting you from point A to point B. What kind of vehicle you use to get from point A to point B doesn't really matter. It could be a truck, a moped, a car, or a bus. If you're driving that vehicle alone, the Securities Commission doesn't care where you go. But the moment you pick up people and put them in your vehicle, you need to follow certain rules and regulations. Securities can include but are not limited to shares, promissory notes, limited partnership units, mortgages, and investment contracts. Yeah, pretty much everything investors use on a daily basis. In Canada, securities are regulated at the provincial level, so each province has a slightly different set of rules. Securities regulations are meant to protect investors. They are essentially consumer protection laws put in place to protect your investors from unfair, improper, or fraudulent practices. And you're probably wondering what falls under trading a security. Well, there are several factors such as engaging activities similar to a registrant, which can include soliciting whether directly or indirectly. And this is where I see a lot of investors making mistakes. For instance, if you post your latest deal on Facebook to try to draw up some attention on that investment, there are rules you have to follow. You cannot post your projected returns and you cannot provide your potential investor with a copy of your pro forma of your potential deal. So how are all these investors raising capital? Well, the short answer is most are doing it outside of the securities guidelines, which is not great but I want you to be on the up and up and feel secure to go out and raise capital in an effective way. So let me break down the seven ways we can raise capital legally here in Canada. There is one way to raise money legally in Canada and that's by filing a prospectus with your local securities commission. This is a very expensive document that takes a lot of time, a lot of lawyers, and a lot of money to create. So most people don't file a prospectus. They work under one of the seven exemptions that you can work under. I'm going to cover the seven main prospectus exemptions here in Ontario, but just know that each province might be slightly different. Number one, the private issuer exemption. This exemption applies where the securities being traded or distributed are those of a private issuer. Think of this uh, like a fraternity. If you're not a member of the Alpha Betas, you can't invest in this deal. And yes, that's a Revenge of the Nerds reference because that movie was awesome when I was in elementary school. Private issuers can only sell their securities to a prescribed class of people. This prescribed class of people includes directors, officers, employees, founders, close personal friends and close business associates, as well as accredited investors and there isn't a cap on the amount of proceeds that you can raise with this exemption. As a summation of this private issuer exemption, you have to have less than 50 investors and they have to fall into a very specific group of people. Exemption number two, the accredited investor exemption. This exemption applies where the purchaser of the security is an accredited investor. Accredited investors are banks, insurance companies, governments, pension funds, and sophisticated individual investors. 
In other words, rich people. Sophisticated individual investors are those that pass one or more of the following tests. First, there's the net financial assets test. To pass this test, the individual, including their spouse, must own financial assets with a net realizable value greater than $1 million. You'll need to calculate this before tax, net of liabilities, and exclude their personal residence. To simplify, if you had to sell all of your assets tomorrow, after you paid out mortgages and any fees or penalties, you'd be left with a million dollars in cash. If so, you are an accredited investor. The second test is the net assets test. The individual, including their spouse, needs to own net assets with a value greater than $5 million. But now, the principal residence can be included in that number. The third test is the net income test. The net pre-tax income of the individual must be more than $200,000 on an annual basis. Or the individual's income plus their spouse's income is over $300,000. The net income test calculations are based on the current year and the two years before that. Exemption number three, the employees, officers, directors, and consultants exception applies to trades by an issuer in its own securities when the recipient is an eligible employee, executive officer, director, or consultant of the issuer. As an example, this would be a company like Apple selling shares to its employees, executive directors, or officers of their corporation. With this exemption, the resale of the securities is subject to a seasoning period. That means there's a minimum amount of time that must go by following the trade. Four months is usually the threshold. Exemption number four, the $150,000 exemption. This exemption applies where the purchaser buys securities for a cost of $150,000 or more. The securities are subject to the same four-month holding period following the trade. Individuals, though, cannot benefit from this exemption as it's restricted to non-individual investors. In other words, a business could invest, but they'd have to invest a minimum of $150,000. And in most cases, if a business has $150,000 laying around, they're going to invest it back into their own business, so this exemption is not as popular. Exemption number five, the family, friends, and close business associates exemption. This exemption applies to certain relatives, close personal friends, and close business associates of the directors, executive officers, controlling persons, and founders of the issuer. This one sounds like the easiest exemption, but the rules are very clear of who falls into the friends and family and close business associates category. If you're ever in doubt, make sure you consult a securities lawyer about who qualifies under this exemption. And that same four month holding period applies to this exemption as well. Number six, the offering memorandum exemption. This applies to capital raised under an offering memorandum made available to investors by the issuer. An offering memorandum is a legal document that states the objectives, risks, and terms of an investment. This document includes items such as a company's financial statements, management biographies, a detailed description of the business operations, and much more. Once an offering memorandum is introduced, there are new investment limits. The limit for non-eligible investors, which sounds like an oxymoron, is $10,000 per 12-month period. For eligible investors, the limit goes to $30,000 for that same 12-month period. But there is no limit for accredited investors, family, friends, and close business associates. If you're unsure of what constitutes a non-eligible investor from an eligible investor, I'll leave a link in the description below for those definitions. And number seven, the crowdfunding exemption. This applies to crowdsourced online funding through a portal operated by a registered dealer. Crowdfunding provides businesses with the opportunities to increase access to capital from more investors than otherwise possible. There are some restrictions on this exemption, one of which is that it's limited to offers up to $1.5 million during any 12 month period for any single issuer group. As a side note to crowdfunding, if you plan to raise $500,000 for an investment, you have to hit your target. If you don't hit your target, for instance, you only raised $400,000, you have to return all that money to your investors. So now we know what a security is, we know what constitutes trading a security, and we know the seven exemptions we can trade securities under. So what happens if we break any of these rules and regulations? In short, the authorities have the right to impose a range of sanctions on individuals and companies for violations of securities law, such as a temporary or permanent ban on trading securities, or they can impose administrative penalties and disgorgement orders. Administrative penalties can be up to $1 million for each failure to comply with securities laws 
in certain provinces. Whereas disgorgement orders require the respondent to pay any amounts they obtained due to their non-compliance with the securities laws. As a final note, if you plan to engage in trading securities, you must register as a dealer, advisor, or under one of the exemptions. In other words, make sure your legal team registers your security with the appropriate governing body if it's required. This can all sound a little daunting, overwhelming, and scary at times, but if you've made it this far in the video, clearly you're interested in staying within the laws of raising capital, which is a good thing. If I can offer one piece of advice, it's to find a good securities lawyer and run your offerings, marketing material, and the way you conduct your business of raising capital by them to make sure that you're on side. You may find this hinders your business in the short term, but in the long term, this will allow you to freely and effectively target the right kind of investors, which will allow you to scale and build your real estate investing business, which is the desired outcome for most of us. If you have questions about this topic or anything else in relation to real estate investing in Canada, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions in the comments section below. If you wanna learn more about real estate investing, I release a new video right here every Tuesday. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and check out my website at darrenvoros.com. With that, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.